many years ago, uh, when I was still a student uh, for the ministry. Uh, Julie and I were in the Lake District on holiday, and on the Sunday, we went to the local evangelical church in Keswick. Two things I remember about that particular visit. One, not great. The other, wow. The not great thing was that the minister really didn't like any noise at all from the kids who were there. He was quite encouraging for them to get out uh, and go to the room on the side, uh, which I thought was maybe a wee bit extreme, but there you go. Some people have just problems with that. Uh, I don't mind noise, Henry and George, that's all right. I'm just glad you're here. Uh, but the other thing, which I remember in a glorious way, was uh, the sermon, uh, the preaching of the word. Um, I can't remember the passage, I can't remember the points. Uh, but I remember the effect, you know, that, that it had on me. Uh, I was a student for the ministry, uh, and it just came in a fresh way that the Lord was really saying to you, yes, this is what I have for you. Because as he preached, I wanted to preach. I really wanted to do it. Uh, the Lord was just calling me into that, uh, and I thank the Lord for experiences like that. It is an experience that I've had many, many times since. The last time I had that uh, was last Sunday night. Colin Moore was here from Strand Millis. He was here in the pulpit. I was down there in the congregation. And he preached Christ from Hebrews 12. And it was just comfort from heaven. It was wonderful. It really just stirred in my heart that same desire again. Not only to receive that balm of God... Uh, but to be here and to preach that same love and mercy and grace of Christ, to preach him. Yeah, we're not all called to that specific ministry, you know, of being in the pulpit, but the same sort of thing happens, I do believe, in a parallel ministry to which we are all called, and that's the ministry of prayer. Uh, last Sunday was our denominational day of prayer. We had extra times of prayer throughout the day. Uh, I heard voices pray that I had often heard pray before. And then I heard new voices which I had not heard pray before. And both did me good. And I hope it did you good if you were here. Or if you're listening today on CD or on the YouTube, I hope there's someone in your life who you can hear pray and hear pray for you because hearing others prayers does us great good last Sunday morning we listened to Jonah from the belly of the fish he was praying I trust it was of encouragement to you as we saw how God heard his prayer and answered his prayer and how God used that repentant prayer to equip Jonah for obedient service before Christmas, we were in 2 Kings 19, and we heard Hezekiah pray for deliverance. Enemies were there and pressing in, and as always, God heard, and God answered, and God assured Hezekiah of his power, and that God would surely defend his people. And such prayers, you know, they're recorded for our good. They teach us how to pray. They're profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Such prayers of other saints, even in our own lives, as well as the prayers of other saints recorded in the scriptures, they're good for us. We do well to listen to them. We do well to learn from them. But as we return to the Gospel of Luke um, this morning, we want to put ourselves into the shoes of this one disciple who says to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. What was it that made him ask that question on that particular day? And the answer is given in Luke 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Here's a disciple. He's been listening. Listening to Jesus pray. And yes, we've put our, ourselves in his shoes already by reading John chapter 17. And, I mean, I'm sure as we read through it, 
you recognize there is such a depth and a wealth of doctrine within that high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus in John 17. I mean, well, if we start with some basics, Jesus called God Father in John 17 and referred to himself as Son. And so we learn something from that immediately in a very simple way. Prayer is not a sort of casual conversation with someone unknown. Uh, prayer is God's children talking with their Father in heaven. Because uniquely so with the Lord Jesus, he is the eternal Son. But we too, we're instructed even by Jesus now to call him, to call God our Father. In John 17, again, God, Jesus acknowledges that God is the sovereign authority behind all authority. He acknowledges that God is the source and giver of life. He prays for the glory of God to be manifested. And I'm sure you, you heard him pray for you that you would be kept. That God would keep you. That God would sanctify you by the word. We have listened to Jesus pray. He's prayed that we would know the love of the Father. And that oneness together in Christ. And while there's much you know, in that prayer of Jesus which is profitable for, for doctrine and reproof and correction the prayer that this disciple heard in Luke chapter 11 verse 1 well that's been profitable for instruction in righteousness because this man wants to be instructed he wants to pray like Jesus prayed so I want us to start there are you in his shoes this morning do you want it do you want to learn pray do you want to pray more do you want to pray better if I asked you at the door are you satisfied with your prayer life what would you say I'm fairly sure that all of us could say well we could do better but to acknowledge that that's not enough because you'll never learn unless you have a desire to learn. And that desire is something which you know we can't just work up within ourselves. We can't just make a New Year's resolution that I'm going to pray more, I'm going to pray better, and hope that that will be sufficient. Okay, it might help. But it's not what we see here happening in Luke 11. There was something external that prompted this new desire to pray in this disciple. And it was Jesus himself. This disciple, he is drawn close to Jesus. This disciple has been listening to Jesus. And so we start there. It's Jesus himself. As David said in Psalm 37 verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart begin again where Colin left us on Sunday night Hebrews 12 verse 2 looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith looking unto Jesus listening to Jesus because the more we look to him and listen to him then the more our hearts will be changed as we delight in Christ our saviour as we delight in his unfailing love for us his children then we are changed inwardly. We're given these new desires. Desires for godliness. Desires for humility. Desires for peace. Desires for reaching the lost. Desiring to be like him. And this new desire here, Luke 11, 1, a desire to be taught by Jesus how to pray. have to be there if our hearts aren't in it if we don't come to the Lord Jesus with this desire to learn to pray then my fear is that the next number of sermons on the Lord's prayer will prove to be sort of useless but if we're looking unto Jesus if we're listening to him then he will give us those new and fresh desires to pray and to pray in the way that Jesus teaches. We need this. We all need this. A 
fresh, hearty desire to pray, and such the Lord gives to all who come to the Saviour and listen, listen to him. Really, that's our first point then this morning. Jesus gives us the desire to pray. So let us earnestly seek that desire by looking to him, by listening to him. The second point then is this, looking to Jesus helps us in the struggle to pray. And really this is the context of Luke 11 verse 1. Uh, Luke, in the writing of this gospel account, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, he puts this episode of Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray just after the Martha and Mary incident at the end of chapter 10. Do you remember that when we considered it at the end of last year? We saw how both Mary and Martha loved Jesus. They both wanted to serve Jesus. But, but verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she ended up not only accusing her sister of laziness, but accusing Jesus of not caring. She got it wrong because she was so distracted. And then we saw that Jesus, however, spoke so gently to Martha. He will not raise his voice in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. Chapter 10, verse 41 and 42, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. The good part, the one thing needed, heart was listening to Jesus. Martha had got distracted. And isn't that the struggle when it comes to prayer for ourselves? So very often we get distracted. We are distracted by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Take a moment in each one. The world. So many distractions. We can just find ourselves too busy. Too busy to make the time to pray. It's like this for so many, many people. A million things to do. Beds to make, meals to make, plans to make, washing to be done, your, your job has to be done, a million other things to be done. Uh, and we can be guilty of rushing just headlong into the day without first sitting at the feet of Jesus. We might feel that many things just have to be done. It's not that we're you know, making a conscious decision not to pray. Maybe we're trying our best. But like it or, like, like it or not, we, like Martha, we are making choices. Uh, like Martha, we tell ourselves, these things are absolutely necessary. I've got to get on to these. These are actually what God has told me to do as well. They're good things. They're for the Lord. But we need to remember one thing is necessary according to Jesus. Very often there needs to be that shift in priorities and get our eyes back on him. And of course there are other times when we're you know we're not really doing the things that we feel are absolutely necessary. Just doing something nice. Nothing wrong with that. And so you make the choice to watch that TV show or read your new book or catch up with that friend. Rather than taking time out to pray. You know, you're not choosing sinful things. No, not at all. But we do make choices which very often don't include time for the Lord in prayer. The world has a million distractions. And even though by grace we, we say no to the harmful and the sinful things, we can still go through any day without choosing the best thing needed thing prayer and with our time with Jesus the desire to pray fades the world runs on and you run on with it then there's the flesh you know when the tempo of the day slows down I'm just too tired I'm just too knackered to do it or maybe you're just not a morning person. Maybe you don't function until the coffee gets in. 
But by then, the, all, all the other duties of the day, they're pressing in too, and off we go. Of course, it's not just tiredness in our flesh that keeps us from Jesus. There's many other aspects of our flesh keep us from him and keeps us from prayer. Our flesh can be frustrated, not able to settle, annoyed with different things that have happened to us that day. Or we can be angry, or sad, distressed. It might just be hunger, or some other, you know, fleshly need that keeps us from prayer. We need to recognize that the flesh is weak, and in our own strength, the flesh just isn't strong enough to sit down with Jesus and pray. We need him. Indeed, it's when we're weak and heavy laden, it's when we're distressed and troubled that he encourages us all the more to come to him. And yes, we find ourselves saying things like, I just need a cup of tea. I just need to sit down for 10 minutes quiet. Maybe a bit more than that. Maybe you say to yourself, I just need tonight off. I'm just going to veg in front of the telly. Maybe a little bit better than that, you say, you know, I just feel I need to phone my mum right now. Lots of little things that our flesh tells us we need. And at these points, yeah, we have to do a bit of the green cross code in our hearts. Stop, look, and listen. When our flesh is craving other things, we need to put it into action. Stop. Stop. Stop, Martha. Stop all of that. Look. Look unto Jesus. Let your heart turn toward him. And then listen. Listen to Jesus. And you know, as we listen to Jesus, it happens. And you'll know what happens, believe me. The more we listen to him in the word of God, and it's all his word, the more we listen to him, then the desire in our hearts rise for him want to pray because we hear him world of the flesh and then there's the devil he does all in his power to keep us from prayer he loves the distractions we've already thought about them he loves doubts does to make you doubt does it make any difference all this prayer you're doing what's the point of that are you praying for somebody in your family Ah, they have no interest in God at all. What are you wasting your time praying for them? They'll never be saved. It'll never happen. He loves to come in and sow doubt. That diagnosis, it's already terminal. There's no point in you praying now. The devil loves to do that. And if doubt doesn't work, then he loves to discourage. The effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. Well, that's hardly you. I mean... Look what you did last week. Look what you said. Come on. So what is he? He loves to do that. The devil loves to get in and, and undermine and discourage God's people. He doesn't want us to pray. Oh, prayer's not cool. Really, you're going to pray in front of your kids when you're out with the friends? Or he'll discourage you by saying, well, you wouldn't really know what to say. Okay, you're, you're there, you're at the door, you're doing a visit with somebody or you're visiting some family member. Maybe you haven't prayed with them before. But you feel that, yes, God would have me pray for this person. But the devil will come and say, no, no, no. No, you, you can't do this. He loves it. And of course, delay. The devil, the devil loves it when he gets us to delay. And, and I fear he is winning a battle on this one. You should wait till you're older. You should wait till you're older. Old people, they do the prayer meeting. <coughs> and I'm sure the devil is whispering that time and time again. Oh yeah, see, when you're older, then you'll have more time. When you're retired, oh, you'll have more time. And those of you who are retired, you know that's a complete lie. You're running around. The devil loves it. He wants you to, yeah, pray later, but but not now. Leave it to your older. And so you get the picture. It's a struggle to pray. It's always going to be a struggle. The world and the flesh and the devil are all conspiring to keep us from prayer. 
And if it's just down to you and me, we're going to fail. But he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And Jesus has said one thing is necessary. The good part is the part that's necessary. And that good part is listening. Listening to Jesus. We've got to listen to him. Look to him. Listen to him. And when we do that, he will teach us to pray. And that is our third and final point this morning. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. And God willing, over the next number of weeks, we'll sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from this pattern prayer that we know as the Lord's Prayer. But this morning, just notice with me in this one verse, the attitude of the disciple as he listens to Jesus and then asks for his teaching. Lord, teach us to pray. And it's that word, Lord, meaning master. This disciple is not asking for teaching from a peer. He is humbly asking to be taught by his Lord. One that he has submitted to. One that he has committed his life to. One whom he is currently following with true devotion. He's following Jesus, looking on to Jesus, listening to Jesus, because the Lord Jesus is his Lord. He's devoted to his master. And because of that devotion to the master, he is going to get taught, and he is going to learn. So are you? That's my question. Are you going to learn to pray? Will these words of the Lord's Prayer make a difference in your prayer life? Well, only if Jesus is your Lord. Only if he is king. Only if you're devoted to him. Only if you're looking to him and willing to listen and obey what he says. Is he your Lord this morning? Are you his disciple? Soon be halfway through Luke's gospel. We've been looking onto Jesus, listening to him all the way through. Have you seen him for who he is? It's only when we know Jesus that that's when we'll really want to sit at his feet and learn from him. And from the very first chapter in Luke's gospel, we've heard that Jesus will be great. He'll be called the son of the highest. The kingdom will have no end. We've heard of his miraculous conception, humble birth. We've heard the angels proclaim that he is the Savior, the Christ, the Lord, the light to all the world. We've watched Jesus grow to be a man. He's entered into his unique ministry. He has defeated the devil in the wilderness. He has preached in Galilee. He has claimed to be God's anointed Messiah. He's fed the hungry, cast out demons, healed many people. Already he has forgiven sins, something only God can do. He has preached love and blessing. His wisdom is undeniable. He has raised the dead. And he has foretold his own death and resurrection in three days. He has shone in divine glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. He sent out his 12 disciples to preach the good news. Chapter 9. Sent out the 70, chapter 10. And now, now he's on this journey to Jerusalem. Now he has set his face steadfastly to go to the cross to die for sinners. That's why he's come. He's come to seek and to save those who are lost in the darkness of sin. Do you know him? know the Lord Jesus for who he really is, is to love him, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you know him this morning as the one who has died for you? Can you say, yes, Jesus is my saviour? Do you call him Lord Jesus?
Can you repeat the first answer of the Heidelberg Catechism? I'm going to read it. They're wonderful words. Can you say it? I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. All who are ready to live for him are well ready to learn from him. So let's keep looking and keep listening to Jesus. Amen. Let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for time together in your presence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are willing to be our teacher. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we, we see we need something even before the teaching begins. We need you to work a uh, deep work in our hearts and stir our desires for you. So we pray for it, Lord Jesus. Pray that we would see you. Pray that we would listen to you. Pray that we would be captivated by you that we would want to be conformed to your image, that we would want to pray as you pray. So please, grant us that desire in our hearts. Give us grace to learn from our Lord, from our Master, from you, Lord Jesus.